Good evening. Thanks for being with us tonight. This is a joint resolution of Congress. It was passed in 1964. Uh, the signatures here, there's the Speaker of the House of Representatives, uh, the President of the Senate, and down here, the big one, that is the signature of the President of the United States. This resolution passed on a Friday. The Tuesday before, the President had gone on TV in a live, late-night, urgent broadcast. My fellow Americans. And in that broadcast, he said the United States Navy had come under attack. He said there had been open aggression on the high seas against the United States of America. The result was the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. It passed in the House unanimously. It passed in the Senate 88 to 2. Turns out we got snookered. It did not happen the way they said it happened, the way they so urgently and sternly informed us that it happened. But it would be seven years before this was repealed. And by then, the escalation that this levered us into had already become the longest yet war in U.S. history, a war that defined an era that indelibly tattooed the generation of political leaders who made it happen or who did not stop it from happening. We say that Vietnam changed our politics forever, but less than 40 years after this, again, a campaign directed at the highest levels of government to get us to agree to a war based on something that did not happen the way they said it happened. It was a months-long campaign in 2002 and 2003, and it worked. It's a decade now since it worked, since they got that war. How did it work? Why did it work? And could it work again? NBC News investigative correspondent Michael Isakoff and Mother Jones's David Korn, an MSNBC contributor, they co-authored a book called Hubris that detailed exactly how that war was sold to the American people. What you are about to see tonight is based on their reporting. We are still too close to all of this in time to know if what some say was the biggest foreign policy deception and disaster in modern U.S. history will define its generation of leaders, too. Whether this is going to be the first line in the obituaries of the men and women who caused that war. But if what we went through 10 years ago did not change us, change us as a country, if we do not understand what happened and adapt as a country to resist it, then history says we are doomed to repeat it again. Here's what happened. The people of the United States and our friends and allies will not live at the mercy of an outlaw regime that threatens the peace with weapons of mass murder. My belief is we will, in fact, be greeted as liberators. There's a lot of money to pay for this that doesn't have to be U.S. taxpayer money, and it starts with the assets of the Iraqi people. You go to war with the army you have, not the army you might want or wish to have. Search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. What weighed on many of us is the 9-11 attack revealed major vulnerabilities. Iraq had been a big problem even before 9-11 and became even bigger and more urgent in light of 9-11. America's greatest national security failure since Pearl Harbor hurls its leaders into a massive national security response. And the people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. Osama bin Laden and his Al-Qaeda terrorist network are the immediate target. But the day after the attacks, President George W. Bush comes to the White House Situation Room and orders counterterrorism director Richard Clark to look into an Iraq connection.
When I said, Mr. President, we will do that, of course, but we've done it before and rather recently, and the answer has always been no, and it's likely to be no this time. He didn't like that answer, and he got mad. I was in, in the room during that time, and he was very adamant about uh, perhaps seeing whether or not Iraq could conduct such an operation against the United States. I was surprised um, when the president left the room. I said, I believe Secretary Wolfowitz got to him. Paul Wolfowitz, Bush's deputy secretary of defense, has had Saddam on his personal enemies list for two decades. Every time he survives something, he sends the message to his enemies, I outlast my enemies, and if you are on the wrong list when I'm still around, you'll be in trouble. Paul Wolfowitz had become convinced that if we looked strongly enough, if we looked closely enough, we'd find the hand of Saddam Hussein behind virtually every terrorist attack on the United States. Even before 9-11, Wolfowitz and Under Secretary of Defense Douglas Fife had been driving administration policy on Iraq. Some of us believed that you will have a, Sad a Saddam Hussein problem forever unless you get rid of him. Meeting notes from the afternoon of 9-11 show Donald Rumsfeld tasking a top aide to find the best info fast, good enough to hit Saddam Hussein. He asks the aide to get evidence from Wolfowitz of a Saddam connection with UBL, Osama bin Laden. We all looked at each other like, what are they talking about? Who the hell... Saddam Hussein, bin Laden hates him, thinks he's a heretic. There's no connection between Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda. The word goes out to the CIA, FBI, and all the intelligence services. Find the connection. First, though, the war on terror goes to Afghanistan to capture or kill Osama bin Laden and destroy the Taliban regime that supports al-Qaeda. By November, the enemy is on the run, forced to flee into the mountains and across the border to Pakistan. But while bin Laden remains at large, Washington's attention turns to Iraq, to Saddam. I think the United States, since Desert Storm, has always had a... a, a, a various planning with respect to Iraq. Operation Desert Storm, also known as the First Gulf War. In 1991, following Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, a U.S.-led coalition of 34 countries drives Saddam's forces out of Kuwait and decimates the Iraqi army in six weeks. But despite that overwhelming victory, President George H.W. Bush faces criticism at home for not going all the way to Baghdad to rid the world of Saddam Hussein. I made very, very clear from day one that it was not an objective of the coalition to get Saddam Hussein out of there by force. Dick Cheney, his defense secretary at the time, supports the first President Bush's restraint. I think we got it right. The conversations I had with leaders in the region afterwards, they were concerned that we not get into a position where we were an imperialist power willy-nilly moving into uh, capitals in that part of the world taking down governments. After the Gulf War, Bush and his successor Bill Clinton send U.S. planes to provide air cover for vulnerable populations in northern and southern Iraq. The UN Security Council imposes harsh sanctions and sends in weapons inspectors to dig deeply for Iraqi WMD capabilities, weapons of mass destruction. This went on for years. At a certain point, unbeknownst to the weapons inspectors or anyone else other than Iraq, it turns out that we had pretty much accounted for the full system, but we didn't know that. In 1998, Saddam refuses to cooperate further, and the United Nations pulls out the weapons inspectors. Saddam virtually seals Iraq off from the West. In a 1998 letter to President Clinton, Paul Wolfowitz, Donald Rumsfeld, and other leading neoconservatives urged the president to take action to remove Saddam's regime from power. 
The neocons align with an urbane Iraqi expatriate named Ahmed Chalabi. Chalabi heads the Iraqi National Congress, a group of Iraqi emigres and defectors lobbying to get rid of Saddam. I say to you now that the opposition is united in its aim of getting rid of Saddam and establishing democracy in Iraq. He was a very impressive and effective spokesman for the Iraqi opposition to Saddam. A very slick operator who uh, was skillful enough to convey the idea that he could step in as a new leader of Iraq. But that was totally divorced from realities on the ground. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear that I will... When George W. Bush is sworn in in January 2001, Rumsfeld, Wolfowitz, and Fife take the reins of Defense Department policy. Vice President Cheney has reversed course and now supports regime change in Iraq. Motive awaits opportunity. And for the Bush administration, 9-11 provides it. Iraq continues to flaunt its hostility toward America and to support terror. This is a regime that has something to hide from the civilized world. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil, arming to threaten the peace of the world. When I heard the axis of evil speech, weapons of mass destruction, I thought, well, something's going to happen. The idea was take actions after 9-11 that would so shock state supporters of terrorism around the world that we might be able to get them to change their policies regarding support for terrorism and pursuit of weapons of mass destruction. General Franks is both a warrior but also a wise and inspiring commander. A declassified memo from November 2001 reveals that Donald Rumsfeld met as early as then with CENTCOM Commander General Tommy Franks to review plans for the decapitation of the Iraqi government. They discuss ideas of how to start a war. One suggestion is to create a dispute over WMD inspections. This is a regime that agreed to international inspections, then kicked out the inspectors. 9-11 made it politically possible for the first time to persuade the American people to break a tradition of not launching offensive wars. The pressure to find evidence falls heavily on all 15 U.S. intelligence agencies. The extremely strong policy wind that was blowing at the time and that everyone in government corridors felt made it absolutely clear what was preferred and what was not preferred. Atta, Mohammed Atta, leader of Al-Qaeda's 9-11 hijackings. From Prague comes a Czech intelligence report of a photograph allegedly showing Mohammed Atta meeting with a high-ranking Iraqi intelligence officer. The photograph of the supposed meeting is never made publicly available. Mohammed Atta was a slight guy, barely what, 5'5", five, 5'6", five, five, and skinny. The guy in the photograph was muscular and thick and had a neck the size of two of my necks. And I mean, that's not Mohammed Atta in that photograph, but send it to the lab anyway. And, and in my mind, the matter was put to bed. In the final analysis... Of but even without the definitive evidence, the vice president goes public with it. It's been pretty well confirmed that he did go to Prague and he did meet with uh, a senior official of the Iraqi intelligence service in Czechoslovakia last April. Several I was sitting in my den in my home in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I remember looking at the TV screen saying, what did I just hear? And I... First time in my life, I actually threw something at the television because I couldn't believe what I just heard. Over and over again, the vice president for years would say, we had a report of this meeting. It's true. There was a report and nobody believed it. 